stakeholders with us. I just want to confirm the following members. Um, you, Chairperson, Member Kongobele, I have Member Mutawung, I have Member Abrahams, I have Member Pilangulu, I have Member Iris, I have Member Manganye, I think I've seen Member Masango as well, she's with us. Uh, if I left off, any members can just indicate so. So those are the members that are with us for now. And I wish to confirm that, Chair, we are a quorum who can take decisions in this meeting. Thank you very much. Pambiling a quorum. Who is Isabel Magaya? I think from Salga. Good morning, oh. Chair. <laughs> Isabel Magaya, I'm Isabel Magaya. I'm from the Center for Child Law. Good morning, oh, Jim. Oh, all right, all right, all right, all right. You, 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 you must be a strong champion for the children. We try, we try. You must fight malnutrition and all those things and so on. Noted. Give us, you. give us, give us a run for our money. <laughs> I'll take you on that <laughs> offer, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Honorable members, good morning. Um, any apologies? Uh, yes, Chairperson, I have a couple of apologies. Uh, we have our standing apology from Member Nguenya, who's not well. And another one is from Member Sukars, who undertook an um, oversight visit with a PC on basic education. She's also with them currently. And member Mvana, she's also not with us. She's in Lesotho with a PC on human settlement on oversight. And then member Oberman, she's also not with us to do today due to party uh, engagements. So those are the apologies with me. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, all the members. Can we table the apologies uh, for consideration? I'd like to... Uh consider the apologies, Chess. Second. Thank, thank you, honorable members, seconded, and uh, we are a very uh, considerate committee. Uh, we are a, human, we're a committee for humanity, for social justice, for inclus inclusion, for shared prosperity. And uh, so we're a committee uh, whose main defining feature is humanity. Thank you very much. Um, the agenda before us, Lindy. Uh, we've done apology briefing by parliamentary legal advisor, briefing by the content advisor, update on the committee secretary on national, by the committee secretary on the national and the provincial public hearings. It's an agenda, honorable members, uh, unless we've got uh, our usual stamina, which we can finish in a very short space of time. Uh, can I table the agenda of consideration, honorable members? I'd like us yes, to attend, uh, the, uh, the, agenda the agenda of the agenda. Can I take, uh, <laughs> okay. Honorable Kate uh, proposes the adoption. <laughs> Who is a second? <laughs> Honorable Masango is second. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Masango is second. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Honorable Members. Uh, honorable Members, I thought we need to take uh, an informed decision on what do we finally do with the educational aspects of our amendment. I requested uh, legal people to take us through so that uh, we close the questions around this because we are focusing on the deadline. But of course, it must be the deadline 
for quality work, not for ticking a box. And I'm happy that we are going to go to provinces. This is one comic that has not been visiting communities. And uh, we tried and uh, it got, it clashed with something last year, Lindy, I can't remember what was it. Uh, but a committee like ours is supposed to spend a lot of his time amongst the people. For instance, one of the things I want us to look at is, as we do this hearing, is it possible that we can steal one or two hours in each province to visit a relevant institution? It was something in my head, but I'm, I'm, I'm careful of clogging the, the program. But I thought we have not been visiting these institutions. Maybe before public hearings, if it starts at 10, we go somewhere at nine o'clock, if there's Houting, Kale, Temba, and so on, just to have a sense of what is happening on the ground. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. I'm just planting it in the heads of uh, members of the committee that uh, maybe we make good use of these visits. Uh, who is presenting the legal opinion, uh, Indua? You must unmute yourself, Linda. Sorry, 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 Chair. There is uh, Mr. Njigela who will take us through the legal opinion because um, Amjai has has other commitments, Chair, but he is in some... So it's a, it's a, Njengane is not around, there's Njigela, at least is he continues with another J in his name. <laughs> Bye. Njigela, can he take the podium? Uh, th thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, um, as Lindy has already said, Chairperson... We want I'm... to see you, especially when you're acting. We want to see you. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> no, this is the face I know. <laughs> this is the face I know. All right. All right. Thank Thank you very much, Chairperson. As Lindy Wei has already stated, I'm standing in for Mr. Mjengana, who is who is having a clash with a, with another committee. Uh, Chairperson, this is um, for a lawyer. This is a bad start for me in the sense that I have to start with a disclaimer. <laughs> I may not <laughs> have the level of depth in terms of the background to the issue but I have tried to familiarize myself with the content of the legal opinion so as to be able to assist the committee to make a right decision in this matter. So I would like the committee to bear that in mind and be patient with me. Uh, Chairperson, I'm assuming that the opinion has been circulated amongst the members. And I will try not to read from the opinion, but just to highlight the key features of the opinion so as to assist the committee in making a decision. Um, the, the key question, Chairperson, that was put to us was whether the committee has the requisite legal authority to amend or reject specific provisions of the bill in as far as they relate to early child childhood development. Uh, Chairperson, we begin the opinion by setting out the, the regulatory framework for the committee. Section 44.1 of the Constitution vests the legislative authority of the Republic in Parliament, which this committee is an extension of. Section 44.4 takes it further and says that in exercising that legislative authority, the committee is only bound by the constitution, nothing else. So you have, in other words, constitutional powers to make law on behalf of the Republic. Section 57 of the constitution again empowers parliament to be able to determine and control its internal arrangements proceedings and procedures. This is the framework, Chairperson, within which the committee works. 
And we take it further, Chairperson, in looking at the regulatory framework, we refer you to Rule 286, sub-Rule 4, sub-paragraph K, which specifically states that the committee may recommend an approval or rejection of a bill or present an amended bill or a redrafted bill subject of course chairperson to the overriding principle that you may not extend the contents of the bill beyond what was introduced without obtaining the permission of the house that is the national assembly that is the framework chairperson that regulates the operations of the committee so the quick answer to the question that has been put forward based on the legislative authority that we have just alluded to chairperson is that the committee has the power to amend the bill that is before it in any manner that it deems appropriate subject to the limitation that if it intended to extend it beyond what was introduced it needs to seek the approval of the house now going into the discussion briefly chairperson um, there are two issues or perhaps three that we need to consider as a committee. One is the issue of the possible migration. I'm using possibly here quite generously. It could be that it's a certainty of a migration of the function of ECD from DSD, which is social development, to basic education. That is a reality, Chairperson, that you are confronted with. That if indeed there has been a decision to migrate the function, what will be the point of a PC on social development passing a legislation on a function that is already moving to a different portfolio? That is a relevant consideration for the purposes of the decision that you have to take, whether you should reject all the provisions that relate to ECD in this bill. The, the second consideration, Chairperson, is the issue that has been raised in the past, which is the lack of consultation. On the basis of the issue that was raised by Salga and the Department of Basic Education previously, you have already taken a step to reject certain provisions that relate to ECD. To the extent that there was no consultation between the, the, the departments, that's a matter for the executive. But there is already a principal decision on that, whether it will be appropriate to allow certain provisions that relate to ECD to survive in the current bill, taking into consideration even the previous issue of migration. The third issue, Chairperson, that the committee needs to consider is the issue of effective legislation. You are a portfolio committee on social development. Your job is to make legislation that relates specifically to the department over which you exercise oversight. With the possibility of migration, there is a risk that you may be making a law which may have to be implemented in a different department in a couple of months from now. And as a committee that is PC social development, you may not be able to exercise oversight over that function in few months time. Is it effective legislation for you as this committee to be legislating for that function, which may lie with a different committee in few months time? But most importantly, Chair, the last point that we will want to make is the issue of compliance with the court order. This legislation was primarily intended to deal with what has been directed by the court, which was to develop a comprehensive foster care system for the country. So some of these provisions that you are seized with at the moment are not directly related to the court order with which you have to comply with, which relates to foster care. So you may be able to discharge your responsibility in terms of the court order without necessarily having to engage on the issues of ECD. So these are, Chairperson, are briefly the four issues that the committee needs to, 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 to consider in making a decision. 
But in conclusion, Chairperson, and in, uh, in trying to summarize sorry, what I think. Well, I hope you will summarize the four issues again. And you walk slowly with us. Okay, Chairperson. All right. Um, in conclusion, Chairperson, and I will try and do exactly what the Chairperson has asked me to do. There is the issue of migration of the function. And I want to, 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 to deal with it together with the issue of effective legislation. That if indeed the function is migrating from social development to basic education, is it effective for this committee to be making legislation that may <laughs> at the end of the day be administered by a different department? That's the first consideration and I'm doing, I'm dealing with two issues at the same time. There is an issue of lack of consultation, which the committee has apparently dealt with previously, of lack of consultation between SALGA and basic education, which as far as I know is undisputed that there has been no consultation. And I think on that point alone, any provision that relates to ECD, which may be possibly moving to basic education, and it has not been consulted properly. It seems to us that there may be a risk there that this matter could be better dealt with by the different portfolio committee and the department that will be receiving the, 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 the function. And lastly, Chairperson, the point is the issue of compliance with the court order, because I think that's what is critical for the committee that it complies with the court order. The court order is specific to foster care, which is not necessarily related to the issue of ECD. The matters can be distinguishable and the matters can be handled differently, more especially in view of the two plus points that I spoke to. So Chairperson, the short answer to the question that you have raised is that in terms of the law, in terms of the constitution, in terms of the rules of parliament, you have the power to reject any bill, you have the power to amend the bill, you have the power to redraft the bill and recommend as such to the house for adoption. So that is the power legislatively it exists. Whether chair you decide to do it is a policy decision, which I'm not best placed to, 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 to make on your behalf. The committee must deliberate and make a decision, but in law, nothing impedes you from doing that. Thank you very much, Chair. Given the, the, the circumstances that I find myself, I would like to limit myself to those four points. Thank you very much. Yebo. Yebo. Uh, I think uh, we must be able to thank you for getting uh, getting on the on the on the on, uh, I mean, getting in in the in that space. Uh, in such short space of time, because I know this was done yesterday. Uh, you know, uh, honorable members, the challenge is uh, we need to we need to demonstrate some uh, deft uh, footwork in managing in managing this whole issue. That's why I thought, let us have this item because even honorable members, ordinary, ordinary, honorable members have been raising questions about this. And, and I thought we continue not to, not to be clear what do we want to do about it. That's why I thought uh, it is important that we get this advice and then probably use our discretion uh, <clears throat> uh, if you look at this thing, honorable members, our essential cause is foster care amendment with a deadline on our face and with all the effects of the difficulty in managing the first care issues as we speak. Of course, we appreciate the fact that social 
assistant amendment bill has actually intervened in a particular way, but the deadline is there, both from the point of the court and also from the fact that the difficulties in managing this process are still there and they've got serious impact, especially on the kids who are supposed to be taken care of and those who are taking care of them. Now that is the essence, but against that, the bill in its original sense is comprehensive. And, but we agreed to focus on the essential elements, but got along with the issue of education. Education that is migrating to uh, basic department of education. And also we are in a process of having a workshop on that migration joint, Portfolio Committee, Social Development and Basic Education. But the background being that it's going to the basic Department of Basic Education, whose, whose legislation will inform by primarily the societal needs and also the context of the department within which it is going to be administered. It's in transit now to that point. We could not even deal with it, this education aspects, this ECD education aspects in full because we had to reject others because they were not consulted because, before coming via cabinet to us. But there are those which were consulted. Now we've got this in sort of those pieces. But what are the legal people saying? The legal people are saying, we are allowed to take a decision on the matter. Because remember, honorable members, what I asked last time is that the fact that we're able to reject certain aspects of this, of the ECD legal aspects, legal, legal, legal clauses, what sort of rationale do we proceed with those that remain because they were consulted? And I've got a view on this matter, but I thought let's discuss this matter and take a definite decision. The option we have here is we accept that this, the, the ECD is in transition to be to Department of Basic Education and that on its own has got its legal implications, which can only be accounted for fully when it is located where it is going. We've got this challenge that, uh, that, 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 that in the, therefore the option is acknowledging that we, we don't do anything that has got to do with ECD education, taking into account the series, of, the series of logistical nightmares that have been put before us. Or, deal with the clauses that are remaining which cannot be divorced from those which we have rejected and produce the aspect of them, hoping that they will connect with something somewhere. These are the, this is the decision we need to take today, but the, key, the importance of legal advice was to say to us, you are empowered to take this decision with regard to the approach on this matter. Am I correct, Njigara? Absolutely correct, Chairperson. Thank you. Honorable members, your participation. Do we continue with these clauses that are, in, that are within which were consulted, having rejected others? Honorable Abrams, Honorable Masango, in that line so far. Um, th thank you, Chairperson. Um, thank you, and thank you to the legal advisor. It is a very um, difficult situation we find ourselves in. Before I'm able to make a decision, Chairperson, I've got some questions that maybe need um, some answering. And the, the question would be, um, in March at our committee meeting, we agreed that there'd be a technical team to actually look into this um, situation we're in and that the technical team would have stakeholders on that team 
that would be, you know, the stakeholders are at the coal face of ECDs, they are on the ground, they are working um, every single day with ECDs. So, you know, we need to take the um, comments and the inputs um, seriously um, in this um, situation we find ourselves in. So my question is, um, was that technical team established and what was the findings and recommendations of that technical team that had the ECD stakeholders on? Um, then also chairperson, um, I would like to know the cost of the bill. If we remove the sections of the ECD, will it bring down the cost of the bill or will the cost of the bill still stay the same? And then, um, Chairperson, what would be the commitment? Obviously, we don't know this, so it's a question we'd need to ask to the Portfolio Committee of Basic Education. What would be DBE's commitment to the ECD sector in saying once it's um, the migration has happened in 2022, what is their timeline to then commit to the ECD sector on all the amendments that actually that we should have now dealt with. Um, but if we say we're not gonna deal with it, what is their timeline and commitment to the sector to get it done as quickly as possible, Chairperson? Because the ECD sector, in my, in my opinion, has been neglected for a long time. And yeah, they finally had an opportunity to deal with all the um, matters and legislative matters and the registration issues, et cetera. And now we once again, they once again on the back foot because now they have to wait for a whole nother year um, when the migration happens. And we are also, we can't predict the future, but you know, we also can't say for certain that the migration is gonna happen by April, 2022. What if it's pushed further and pushed further and then the entire ECD sector is just pushed further and further and we see the sector crumbling because I mean, COVID really hit them hard. They're still waiting for the, the funds from the, pres the presidential stimulus fund. I just, I feel that, um, you know, we keep pushing them aside instead of just dealing with the, the issues in terms of this legislation. So Chairperson, before I can, commit whether we, you know, s exclude the whole ECD sector, you know, what is that report from that technical team that was supposed to be established in March? Thanks, Chair. Uh, honorable, thanks, Honorable, honorable Masango. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry I'm not going to show my, my face because I've already been cut off uh, since this meeting has started. So the connectivity doesn't seem to be uh, uh, with us this morning. I would like to very uh, um, sincerely thank the, uh, the, our legal person for having made this presentation this morning, which has sort of taken away from me many of the sort of very niggling questions that I've been asking myself in as far as this is concerned. And um, having clarified, uh, especially on the issue of effective legislation, I, 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 I seem to remember discussing this yesterday um, at a, at a, at a, with, 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 the, with the person that I was discussing it with and just being worried about the waste of legislative processes that would have gone into this when we already know and ha it has been presented to us that D uh, ECD is going to DBE. And in, in, in really appreciating the concerns that have been raised by my colleague, uh, um, uh, Honorable um, Abrahams, but I also need to um, base my uh, my uh, sort of recommendation on on the uh, Department of Social Development and the purpose for which this uh, legislation is being done, which is the the comprehensive legal solution that has been outstanding for a very long time. So uh, to say that given this, um, the, 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 the clear that we've been given at a legal level and the very strong 
um, sort of uh, issues that have, are being raised, um, most important of which for myself being the migration and the legislative, uh, effective legislation, I would, I would chair, agree that each and every uh, aspect or clause of the bill that relate to early childhood development are being taken off of this bill, um, and 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 we are we remain with the aspects that do not touch the early childhood development, uh, just because we have the deadlines. We want to be uh, effectively legislating, and also we have. Um, the migration that is on that is ongoing, and the deadline for the migration has already been a sort of a highlight, sort of um, uh, indicated. So that would be my my recommendation. Say I'm just going around in circles, but I I I I, I, I trust you get where I'm getting. Thank you, Chair. If if, if I hear you, on a Masam, you are saying we we dispense with the aspects of the ECT that are remaining? Yes, most definitely. Okay. The, the, okay. the disputed ones and the not disputed ones. Just okay. everything ECD. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Honorable Aris. Thank you, Chair. Chair, no, I actually also want to ask in terms of the technical uh, a team, but I'm covered with 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 Honourable Abrams. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Members. Uh, I see no other hand. Uh, Honourable Manganye. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairperson, and good morning to Honourable Members. Uh, Chair. I wanted to comment on what uh, Honorable Masango was saying. Indeed, you can't say you, you, you want a baby. I want to use this thing that the the food we are doing is like a little person we are doing. Okay, all right. <laughs> you can't say you want to have a baby, you get pregnant. And then you, on the way you say, no, it was a mistake I bought. So we must do the things that they will benefit the early childhood. We can't start, uh, finish something that we are not going to oversee. Uh, it's not, it, it will be no longer in our hands. I'm suggesting like Honorable Masango, we must focus on the issue of the court. If it doesn't affect anything, got anything to do with the early childhood, let's fo uh, focus on that uh, foster care so that we, 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 we finish with what is a stumbling block to us. I really concur with Honorable Masango. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Honorable Mangani, from all the way from Houten uh, Bupirim. Is it Houten Bupirim? Bukoni. 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 Bukoni Bupiri. Right. Uh, I thought Bukoni uh, Bukoni Limpopo. The purple is quiet. Uh, honorable members, if I'm, I'm ready, maybe what we need to agree upon, I think I have a sense where the members, I, to be honest with you, I'm covered by Honorable Mangani and Honorable Masango, and I don't think Honorable Abraham is in disagreements, but I think the question she is raising, uh, I'm not sure if Lindy, you want to say anything about them? especially the task team. Okay. Um, uh, good morning, members. Uh, yes, Chair, I would like to respond to the issue raised by member 
Abrams uh, around the technical team that is supposed to come and present to the committee. Yes, that was the resolution taken by the committee. Uh, I wish to record that um, they will be scheduled to come and appear before the committee on the 19th of May in two weeks time chain. So in, in other words, the, your, your question, Honorable uh, Abrams, are still going to be attended to, but they don't change. They could not change the fact that uh, to take a leg of ECT, which is not going to be implemented, awaiting a full implementation of ECT bill remains an illogical thing, in my view. But however, that will still be answered, but at least we've got a certainty with regard to this now. Chair? Honorable Abrams? I, I just want to then ask, Chair, but if they're only coming to present to us on the 19th, and we are already having national public meetings. Will, will those stakeholders still be presenting then on ECD? And then do we still listen? And then we only make our decision after the 19th? Or, or So do the stakeholders then still present to us on ECD um, next week? Uh, the, the point is, I think that's a major question that we should answer. You want to chase people away. Did you think about that, Linda? Can I respond, Chair? Yes. Uh, this committee took a decision to listen to all the submission, whether it's ECD or not, taking into account that when it comes to the formal stage of the bill, they will remove all ECDs. The consultation that the the technical team, it will consist of SALGA, the Department of Basic Education, the state law advisor, our parliamentary law, uh, state law advisor, that doesn't include the stakeholders at large. We will have our public participation process accommodating all, all the submissions, even from the ECD sector. So that one is taken by the committee. That one is more of the legal aspect to guide the committee in the decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I saw Honorable Abrams' thumb. She's happy. We are all happy in this family. Thank you very much. The resolution is clear now, Lindy. Am I right? Yes, Your President. Thank you very much. So we reject uh, all those ECT. Then they, so that we're going to participate when the DBE is taking care of the full legislation. But we're going to be there to, because remember, honorable members, this, this, this portfolio committee will always have an interest in the state of the children, whether ECD is with us or not, because of the nature of our work, which is cutting across. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Njigelana. Jikela, hey, thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you, you for the steady work. Thank you very much. Uh, so when the third person comes, you must have a J in the Senate. Mother House will dismiss that person. You must have a J or a Yan, something like that. I will come J. in. I will come in. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Next item. The next item, Chair, is our Honorable content yeah. Advisor to take us next through the submission. Yeah, ne next item, I remember, uh, content Advisor would have analyzed all submissions. There's a thicker document. I think she's going to take us through the highlights. All its basic purpose is to prepare us to actually engage with the bill uh, in an empowered position on more informed basis. Thank you very much. Connect advisor. Unmute. Thank you, Chair. Morning. Morning, members. Morning, colleagues. I'm just going to share my presentation. <clears throat> Can you see it, members? Yeah, I bought yep. <clears throat> Okay. Without wasting any time, Chairperson, let me start. 
Um, these are the uh, table of contents for, on highlighting the issues I'll be speaking on, uh, which are the key themes that emerge from our analysis of the, of the submissions as well as the, the bid itself. We identified them as such as um, definitions that are contained in the bill, the parental responsibilities and rights, the, the issue of guardianship, the issue of children's rights pertaining to their privacy, child marriages, genital mutilation, virginity testing, corporal punishment. There's also a provision pertaining to the child protection services, the foster care, child and youth care centers, drop-in centers. There's also provisions on the ECD, which is also um, uh, classified or falls within the partial care. There's issues raised in terms of uh, funding of the programs. <clears throat> and also as you're aware, chairperson, the issues of adoption services. There is also um, submissions that were made on the National Child Protection Register issues on the intersectoral implementation of the bill. And also there were some comments that were made on the bill itself. And Jefferson, I just want to, uh, with your permission and, and your members, just to sneak in the inputs that were made by the Department of Home Affairs. But just quickly highlight that uh, they didn't necessarily make a submission in the true sense or like other stakeholders did but they were invited by the committee as a consultation process. But there are certain aspects that were the, the members of the public race that relate to what they provided as inputs to the, to the committee. Chairperson, just to, um, as an introduction to say, uh, just want to just explain now, this just serves to highlight the key issues that emerged as uh, we were uh, summarizing the submissions. There were extensive recommendations that were made, you know, that were made uh, equally with the inputs that were made. However, Chair, due to the scope of this presentation and the time, I um, have not included those. Um, may, most or majority of them are quite technical. And so those recommendations, as which is the norm, will be forwarded to the department. Can you repeat uh, what you have not included, Yoli? The recommendations. You say you have not included something. Can you repeat that? I'm saying, Chairperson, the recommendations that were made by the stakeholders are quite extensive. They're very detailed, and they also and also in technical in nature, majority of. Them. So, Chairperson, for the scope of this uh, presentation, I'm only going to highlight the key issues that emerged as we uh, summarizing the and analyzing the input. However, that is not lost, Chair. There will be a meeting that um, organized by the committee where the department will be invited to come and respond to those recommendations. What normally happens, maybe if members can recall with the social assistance, the department will come and table all the recommendations that were made and then they will respond in the sense of saying, do they support those recommendations or not support and they'll give it for such. Then thereafter, the, the committee will then deliberate on, on, on what was submitted, the, the recommendations made and the input from the department. So that process is coming to present is not lost, but I thought for the scope of my presentation today, I'm not going to focus on those recommendations. However, to say, the report, there are two reports that I, I, I worked on, the comprehensive one, which is like a detail that has all the stakeholders' inputs and their recommendations, and the summarized one that I submitted to members yesterday. On the summary ones, I did highlight some of the recommendations. If maybe the members had a chance to go through the report, they will see those. However, there will be a report that I will also forward to the members that will have all the details or all the recommendations forwarded to the committee. But for the sake of the, the time and the scope, I'm not going to go into detail on those recommendations that has been asked. OK, um, going forward, Chair, uh, to look at what we received. And just to explain that you see the number there that we received 3629, which is quite high compared to what I said before. 
That is because, Chair, at that time, we had not started with the summary uh, or, or processing the submissions. So we only uh, based that now, then the 2.2, 2,200 on what was reflected on the inbox, the, the entries that were in the inbox. However, subsequently, after we went through the submissions and the inbox, we realized that there were some uh, entries, entries in, the, in, in the email that had attachments, uh, multiple attachments on those uh, emails. And those emails were mainly from the real reform on EC campaign. And the, the, then the, the campaign submitted to us a document that had a, a, a list of all the, I'll say the signatories or the members of this campaign. So we had 150 organizations are part of this and 1,495 individuals who then form up or are part of this reform on ECD. That chairperson, uh, we only um, picked it up as we're going through the submissions now, pay inbox and processing them per submission received. Then, Chairperson, there was another uh, um, bulk of submissions that we received from uh, DS South Africa. Those submissions, they totaled 1,693. And then we have the 291, that is a difference. So in all, Chairperson, what we have before us is 3,629 submissions. I hope uh, it's clear to members. And I did indicate before that the numbers were, were fluctuating because some of the e emails were duplicated. So we had to also clean that as well. <clears throat> if I now go zoom into the actual uh, themes as per the submission, starts to indicate to the members which themes of the bill attracted more input. If you look at this chart, graph before you chair, the child protection services, the adoption services, the definitions, those are the ones where I look at the, the organizations and look what they focus on. And then I counted how many of those organizations spoke to definitions, they spoke to the issue of child protection, they spoke to the issue of adoption. But I just want to say, Chairperson, there is uh, also a number that, was, uh, that came in terms of the guardianship that there was an interest on that as well, Chair. And also the issue of, for oh, some reason it's not appearing here, the issue of parental responsibilities and rights. Those are the other issues that emerge quite strongly, Chair. Then to, when it comes to the definitions, Chair, I just picked up what so that, those I thought are key and also they received um, a, major, a, a high portion of uh, uh, inputs on them. There was Jefferson, a proposal that came in with the submissions for the inclusion of the definition of corporate punishment. I, I'm gonna speak a bit more in detail, Jefferson, when it comes to that aspect of the bill. So I'm just putting it here that there is a proposal that the bill should include the definition of corporate punishment. Then I'll speak more in detail just in a few minutes, Jefferson. I don't want to repeating myself when I get there. Then there was also Jefferson in, in inputs with regard to the definition of a child in need of care and protection. As in, there the issue is there is a proposed clause in the bill, which is one, subsection C, which proposed for the insertion of these words, it is a child who has no knowledge as to the whereabouts of the parents, guardian, and caregiver, and such information cannot be ascertained by the relevant authorities. This definition, Chairperson, I'm also going to allude it to later. The stakeholders they questioned the reasons why it was included in the bill. But I'm going to speak to it later, Chairperson, but it's false under definition. So the, 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 mem the members of the public they raised it as a recommendation to the committee to seek clarity on why it was included in the definition of this uh, child in need of care and protection. 
Then there was another one, Madam Chair, I'm just going quickly and I'm not going to details because this is just definition. There's a cl proposed clause uh, that, that the a submission that the, the definition of care as it appears in the bill is vague, and there's a suggestion that it needs to be, it to be expanded to include these words, guiding the behavior of the child in a humane manner using positive parenting and nonviolent disciplinary methods. Chairperson, I just want to say to the members, this can be read in context of what is raised by the stakeholders that there should be an inclusion of bill of, on the issue of the ban of corporate punishment. I'm gonna to speak to it later, Chairperson, as well. There's also a, such a impulse about the, that the, diffusion, the, the definition of ECD contains school going age, but that is not defined in the bill. There's a support chairperson, I'm gonna go into details later on, on the clarity or an amendment to define an orphan. And that uh, is mainly supported by the stakeholders, but I'm gonna to speak to it a, bit, uh, a few minutes as well, chairperson. There's also support for the definition of the separated migrant child, which the uh, stakeholders felt that it will assist the cause in dealing with the practical issues they are faced with regard to the uh, group of children. Chair, before I, I just move on to the next um, themes, I just thought, like I said, go back to what the Department of Home Affairs has submitted to us or they presented to us. In this instance, Chairperson, uh, they commented that it found the definition of a child as a migrant a bit problematic for them because in, in, in their explanation, the person who is a migrant is the parent. So it was not clear in terms of uh, the argument who is the migrant, the child or the, the parents. So it had requested that definition be revised they also uh, pointed out that they had raised the same issue with the Department of Social Development during the consultation stage. So I just thought I should raise this chairperson in the light that I just mentioned earlier, that stakeholders, they supported uh, that definition of a separate micro child. Oh, just went backwards. Okay. Chairperson, when it comes to the provisions as far as parental responsibilities and rights are concerned, the majority of the submissions supported the amendments and as they seek to protect the rights of unmarried fathers, both in cohabiting or non-cohabiting uh, relationships. They, however, oppose the, delete, the, the proposed deletion of section 213B that states that any party to the mediation referred to in subsection 21.3 may have the outcome of the mediation reviewed by the court. Basically, here, Chairperson, is the, that section that is uh, being proposed to be deleted. It makes provisions in instances where the mother and the, and, and the father of, of, of the child have, for some reasons, have in a, they're in a, in a dispute regarding the father may be fulfilling his uh, obligation as set out in the act. So the bill proposes that that, that section be deleted. Now, the, the, the inputs or the arguments from the, from the stakeholders is that the memorandum of the bill does not explain why this, 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 subsec, this subsection of the act is being deleted. So they feel it is left out to speculations as to the reasons why it is proposed to be deleted, Jefferson. So that's something that the committee may have to look at to get clarity from the department. It was also argued that the mediation process should be allowed to be reviewed by the Children's Court and then by the High Court. Also, Jefferson, there's an amendment that was supported as well, which enables a family advocate to issue a certificate confirming that an unmarried father has automatically acquired the parental rights and responsibilities, the PPR stands for that person, in terms of subsections 21, subsection 1A or 1B of the Act. 
the, 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 the argument here is that it do reduce the number of instances in which an unmarried father has to approach the court for an official document to confirm his parental rights and responsibilities. So now the bill allows for the family advocate to issue that. Also, Chair, it was uh, submitted that the certificate should not be made a legal requirement with respect to the birth registration, birth registration by an unmarried child, father. Only required in, in, in instances of a dispute between the father and the mother, whether the father should be included in the birth certificate. So what they're saying here, Chairperson, my, my interpretation of this is that the unmarried fathers should be allowed to apply for a certificate. However, only if um, there, there's a dispute between the mother and the father of the inclusion of, of, of the father in the certificate, then there should be some legal requirement that should follow that person. And also it's, the argument is that in cases where a mother is deceased or her whereabouts are not known, the birth certificate should not be required by the Department of Home, of home Affairs prior to accepting a birth registration application from an unmarried father. So that's what the public are saying, Chairperson, that the unmarried father should be able to apply for a birth certificate in, in instances where the mother is deceased or her whereabouts are not. Okay. Now, the other argument raised, Chairperson, was that the stakeholders, they felt that the act and the bill make a distinction between a married father and unmarried father. And that it comes with the requirements that an unmarried father have to fulfill in terms of section, six, section 21 of the act for them to acquire parental responsibilities. So the, 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 the submission or the field is that there is that distinction whether you are married or not married. And if you are married, then you have to meet certain legal requirements as specified in section 21. So that was a concern that was raised by the stakeholders. Then going back to what the department had presented to the committee, it did um, uh, inform the committee that there will be uh, legislative changes that are coming to section 10 of the Birth and Death Legislation Act, which will make provisions, which will regulate which regulates the provisions of a surname. Uh, okay, I was trying to say here, Chairperson, I just um created a typing error here. The 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 this amend the legislation that have been uh, uh, proposed that are coming from the department will provide for a father and a mother to be able to uh, Oh, okay, I got it. Check. It says that the legislation of a birth of a child which will regulate the provision of a surname to a child born to an unmarried parent. This section will provide for the child to receive the mother's surname and the father's surname only at the joint request of the father and the mother. Just lost my my my, my train of thinking, the chairperson. So the department had said to, to the committee that. They are. They would be making some changes in the in this uh, birth and death registration act that will make provisions for an unmarried mother and a father as far as the uh, the child acquiring the same name of either the mother or or the father. And also, this legislation would give the father an equal right and status status to the reg registration of a child. Such a parent has parental rights and responsibilities in respect of a child, but that uh, they also also mentioned Chairperson that they were also awaiting for a constitutional ruling on the matter that was raised of a father who applied for a registration of the best definition of the child without the mother being present. At present now, the Department of Home Affairs in terms of these laws, it doesn't allow the father to make such an application in the absence of the, of the mother. So there are two processes here, Chair. One is the ruling from the Constitutional Court and also the department based on that 
amending the Birth and Death Registration Act, Chairperson. I hope I'll try to explain uh, what the uh, department has submitted to the committee. The department also, Chairperson, alerted the fact that when that is made, only the court would revoke such a right of a registration to the father if there is a legal basis for such a parent to be limited to the register his child. In this, but in this particular case, the, the best interest of a child would remain paramount. Chaperson, when it comes to the issue of guardianship, which is closely linked to the parental responsibility and rights uh, provisions of the act, just they, they go together. The stakeholders supported the inclusion of the uh, of the children's court in the applications of guardianship. Here, Chaperson, before the children's court were was not were not included as a court that will consider applications for guardianship. The issue that was raised here in support of this uh, in, uh, proposed inclusion is that applications to the High Court are quite uh, expensive in terms of the legal uh, costs in, involved in them. Chair. So the, the stakeholders supported and welcomed the inclusion of the Children's Court in such instances where application is to be made for guardianship. They also supported amendments to Section 45, 3A and 3B as they make provision for the guardianship orders in relation to all children to be granted by either the high court or the children's court. So charities, they go together. However, they raise a concern uh, that other related sections of the act are not amended to provide for children's court to, come, to consider application for guardianship. So this is just a technical uh, issue chair that the department may need to look at as they read through the comprehensive report that we have that has the recommendations made that there should be cross-referencing of the inclusion of the children's court as far as uh, applications for guardianship is concerned. Okay, when it comes to the children's rights, um, the first one relates to rights to privacy of, of, the, of children. And which, which is, a, uh, is a clause that seeks to amend Section 6 of the Act. Now, Section 6 of the Act, is, uh, the amendment to Section 6 is that there will there is a proposed insertion, insertion of subsection 6A. This section seeks to provide protection for a child, rights to privacy and inform, uh, information. However, the stakeholders' uh, submissions or argument is that the Bill at the same time seeks to delete section 74 of the of the of the end, which deals with uh, protections of the child as far as releasing information about the identity of the child, including photos uh, during the court proceeding. So this section prohibits those, the publication of such information uh, related to the court proceedings. However, the proposal in the current bill before us is that that section uh, is, it should be deleted. Now, the stakeholders are then uh, uh, questioning that why should it be uh, um, deleted that section? Because the, 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 um, the explanation given by the department is that its inclusion would be superfluous. So the, the stakeholders are then questioning the reasons of the, of the department to delete that section 74, because the one that is proposed on its own, they argue, fails to, to protect the rights of children as far as proceeding, uh, court proceedings are concerned. I hope, Chairperson, this is clear. And then there's also submissions that, uh, 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 um, inputs that were made by the stakeholders, that there is a need for the legislation to explicitly safeguard the child's rights to privacy, to privacy in the context of online and of offline platforms. Here, Chairperson, the, the, the submission made is that children need to be protected as far as the digital space is concerned, and also the non-digital platform is concerned. For instance, the issues they, they, they made as illustrations in terms of uh, the digital platforms the activities that take place there in terms of tracking uh, and monitoring, broadcasting of children's images, 
collection of children's personal data and other online criminal activities that happen in that space. So the, the submission is that the bill needs to also take that into consideration as it makes provision for the protection of the children's rights. The interpersonal in, uh, in, uh, in relation to what I just said, the submission is that there needs to be a distinction made between the data protection and personal information of children and identity information. Let me just go to the next slide. In this instance, Jefferson, it was explained that protection of personal information relates to the processing of personal information, such as collection, receipt, storage, and dissemination of personal data. Then there is a prevention of publication of identity information, which relates to the protection of the identity of the child who is party to a children's court proceeding. So the, the submission here is that the, these are two um, uh, processes. Chairperson one deals with the personal information of the child, as far as, like I said, the online and offline platforms are concerned. There's also a protection and prevention of publication of a child's identity information during the court's proceeding. Okay, before I go that. So the, the, the proposal is that, Chair, the first, the, there should be a dedicated chapter in the bill that will look at the protection of children's uh, personal information as far as it relates to the online and offline um, platforms. Currently, the bill mainly focuses on the protection of children's information as far as the proceedings of the, of the court are concerned. I hope to present it um, myself clear. Then moving to the child marriages, the stakeholders support the amendments that uh, the bill introduces as they believe uh, they are aligned to the international commitments and regional obligations which are South Africa is part of. They are, have argued that the bill fails to clearly state that child marriages are prohibited in South Africa and that 18 is the minimum age of marriage as well as that no child can be given out, out in marriage or engagement, even with the consent of a parent, guardian, or a state official. So the submission that is the, on, this is, on this regard is that even though the bill makes such a provision, it has to make it very clear that uh, child protection, it, it, child mar mar marriages are prohibited in South Africa and the, the minimum age is 18. Uh, in this instance, Chairperson, just to remind the members, the department did uh, present to the committee or uh, make a, uh, an input when it was uh, invited by the, by the committee that it is currently in the process of developing a marriage policy and the issue of, age, of the, uh, the minimum age to enter marriage will be considered and was identified as a critical aspect to be addressed in the policy. And the main aim of the policy is to align minimum age to the provision of the Children's Act. So there is already something that the action that the Department of Home Affairs has taken in regards to child marriages, Jefferson. The issue of genital mutilation, there was a stakeholder, Jefferson, um, that raised a, a concern that um, it's basically people from the intersex, intersex sector who raised the concern that um, the intersex people, they are still subjected to uninformed and unnecessary genital, what they call genital normalizing surgeries as children with the aim of altering their sex characteristics to suit social, social classifications of male and female. So basically, Chair, they are submitting the committee of, of that South Africa even though it, um, this practice of genital mutilation is prohibited by in global frameworks and which some of them South Africa is part of, but the issues of or the surgeries on intersex, particularly minors, are still performed in South Africa. And so they raised that as a concern, Chairperson. 
So the, the, the submission is that the committee should ensure that it consults with the intersex-led organization to ensure that the bill makes provisions to prohibit this practice of um, uh, genital, um, genital normalizing surgeries, the phrase it that way, chapter. And they submit that a chapter should be dedicated to them. Chairperson, there was one submission from the National House of Traditional Leaders on virginity testing, even though it's not necessarily in the bill, but it makes a, a, recommendation, a recommendation that the virginity testing should be performed, taking into consideration the maturity and the stage of development, and a female child has the right to refuse uh, virginity test. That's just that submission, Chair. Then going back to what I addressed, Chair, on the issue of the ban on corporate punishment, the stakeholders submitted that there should be a new, or they recommended that there should be a new subsection 1211 in the, in the, in the act that will ban uh, corporate punishment. The submission is based uh, on the constitutional court ruling of, that was made in 2019 that declared the common law defense of reasonable and moderate chastisement invalid and unconstitutional. In essence, Jefferson, it banned uh, corporate punishment. So based on that, the stakeholders then proposed that there should be a sec an insertion of a definition of corporate punishment, and that definition should be aligned to the National Child Protection Policy as well as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of, of the Child. So the, 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 the decision, the, the definition chairperson was provided uh, that uh, should be inserted on the, on the bill. I can read to the members if they so wish, uh, if they can just give me time, just a few minutes to, to. It says corporate punishment or physical punishment means any punishment in which force or action is used and intended to cause some degree of pain or harm. It involves, but is not limited to hitting children in any environment or context, including in a home setting, with a hand or instruments such as a whip, stick, belt, shoe, or wooden spoon. It can also involve, for example, kicking, shaking, or throwing children, scratching, pinching, biting, pulling hair, or boxing ears. Caning, forcing children to stay in uncomfortable positions, burning, scalding, scalding, or forced ingestion. This is a decision a definition chairperson that is proposed by the stakeholders, which they explain that it is in line with the National Child Care, Pro Child Care and Protection Policy and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children. Okay, uh, coming to the Child Protection Services Chairperson, which now it speaks to the legal uh, um, solution that the, the court had made a ruling on is to, uh, to address challenges in the foster care uh, system, Chairperson. This is the sessions of the bill that tries to uh, make a provision for such. Okay, the amendments seek to provide a legal solution, like I said, to the foster care challenging by amending section 150 to clarify a child in need of care and protection. Just to explain to the members, a child in need of protection is defined as a child who's abandoned or orphaned and has no, the highlight, the bold and underlying it's from me, person, has no, just for emphasis, has no parent, guardian, family member, or caregiver who is unable and, and suitable to care for that child. The child is also, this, this will also include an unaccompanied migrant child from another country, a victim of trafficking, or a child who has been sold by a parent, caregiver, or guardian, should it be a question, a, a comma, the chairperson. So, the amendment seek to provide that the court may extend. Oh, there's another one, Chair. So just to explain here, Chairperson, if you go back to um, what the, was presented before 
to the committee when we were considering the social amend social assistance amendment bill. That one chairperson dealt with the top up as a legal uh, so, uh, solution to the child support grant. Now, their chairperson, it was explained that the children's amendment uh, bill will come and provide a further legal solution that the court had uh, ruled that it must be developed. So in this instance, Chaperson, the X is to say, a child, Chaperson, who has no parent or a guardian or a family member, that child, Chaperson, is a child in need of care and protection. And by that, that, that means that that child will be uh, eligible for or to be placed in the foster care system. Then a child chair who is a, uh, a child who has no parent or is orphan, but that child lives with the family. That child will then be excluded. However, that child would be eligible for the provisions that were made in the social assistance amendment bill for the top up of the child support grant. In essence, chapters in that reading, etc. what is written here, there's in essence what this legal solution speaks to, uh, to, to or the bill seeks to provide as a legal solution. So the stakeholders that supported this amendment, um, as far as it relates to the child need of care and protection, and that those ones who are in the care of parents they then can be uh, uh, redirected to the child support grant system. However, they submit that the amendment should make it more explicit by stating that only children who are in the care of family members should be excluded. So as it is, the, that it has not been made uh, uh, explicit. So the, the suggestion is that the bill must make that uh, clear that those children who are in the care of their families, even though they don't, may not have parents or caregivers, but they're in the care of a family, are excluded from the foster care system. In essence, that's what is said here. They also submit that when a child who is placed with a relative with whom the child does not have a bond, that placement should be a foster care placement so that the state can supervise and monitor it for the first two years. If the child and a relative are both happy with the arrangement, it then could be converted to a guardianship after two years. I uh, can move chair, I hope the members are clear as far as the legal solution that the bill seeks to provide. Uh, even though Chairperson, there are some um, stakeholders who supported, there are others who questioned the amendment in the sense that they argue that by extending, uh, or just to mention that the, the, the bill also seeks to extend, so to give the, the, the children's court, uh, uh, to allow it to extend the foster care order that has lapsed for a period of up to six months. So the bill makes that as another uh, provision uh, to try and provide a legal solution to the foster care system that the children's court may extend a loved court order. Now, these uh, submit, uh, stakeholders they then argue that it is an overstretch of the law to make up for a lack of implementation capacity, and they say it's a lack of comprehensive legal solution aimed at reducing the foster care. Load. That's the argument that was advanced by a stakeholder. It also pointed out that this provision will not prevent SASA from stopping payments of the foster care grant on the day the foster care orders expires. It, it only ensures that the foster care will later be reinstated and be back, in back paid when the extension order is finally submitted to SASA. So in essence, the foster case grant they will still lapse for a period of time. So that's the submission that is what was made by one stakeholder. There was also some, another concern that was raised that once the bill becomes an act, 
approximately 300,000 orphaned or abandoned children who are already in the foster care system with family members are at a risk of losing their foster care orders and consequently their foster care grant. This is because they, they submit when their cases come back to the court for review in terms of section 159. The children's court will, will review their cases against the criteria specified in section 151A, which in, excludes new applications for foster care by family members caring for an orphan or abandoned children. As magistrates may interpret these sections to that existing foster care play, placements of orphans with family members must be terminated. In other words, Chair, the concern is that there are orphans or children who are approximately 300,000 who are in the foster care system, and these are the children who live with their parents. Remember, Chair, the amendments seek to exclude the children who are in the care of their family members um, from the foster care system and redirect them to the child support grant system. Now, the issue here is there are those children who are already in the system and who are in the care of their family members. And then the other concern is that the bill proposal is too broad and will result in the department and the children's court requiring, requiring social workers to find absent parents of this distant family and, and place children in informal, informally with absent parents or distant families with no supervision or support. And then this is not be the best interest of the child. So the concern is that Chair, with this amendment, there may be a risk that uh, there, there will be a requirement for, for social workers to find uh, the absent parents or the distant family members so as the children to be um, uh, part included in the either the foster care system or in the child support council. Then the issue of the early childhood development yeah, that we just spoke about. The stakeholders, uh, mainly, uh, like I said, they came from the real reform on ECD campaign, which made of those 1.6 uh, or so uh, signatories. Their main argument is that the bill is a missed opportunity in that it does not address the challenges, the long-standing challenges in the sector, uh, which for example are the multiple registrations processes that are required. They, for example, make uh, this uh, 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 submission uh, from the bill that the bill in one chapter, it requires for two uh, ECT strategies to be done, two provisions for the assignment of, of functions to municipalities that are made by the bill, two registration processes, two different funding mechanisms, two different enforcement provisions, and two different appeal and review pro provisions. All of these chapters are provided in one chapter of the bill. So the, is, the, the concern is that the bill then it makes provisions for all these multiple processes that the ECG center will have to, uh, will be required to, to, to implement or follow. And also they argue that it, in so doing, it fails to address the challenges of the complicated norms and standards, which do not respond to the realities of the rural and poor communities. Their argument is that these norms and standards are driven by international standards and are underpinned by high living standards. So those people in the rural areas or Kumba communities are unable to fulfill or to meet these norms and standards. Also, Jefferson, um, and uh, the submission or inputs that we made was that um, the child's ECD program is defined as that that uh, as as is for for children more than is for more than six children from birth to school going age. However, the definition of partial care as well also, Chairperson, I lose. It defines partial care 
as a, 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 a facility that will look for after the children uh, from, the, from birth to the school going age. So in other words, Chaperson, the, the deficient, definition of partial care and the definition of, of the ECD is included under the definition of partial care. And also partial care is included in the definition of ECD. So the input from the public is that one facility will be subjected to a person to uh, follow processes as far as ECD uh, registration requirements are concerned, as well as for the partial care uh, 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 registration requirements are concerned. So the input from the public is that the ECD should not be included under partial care. And in 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 in, in explaining what uh, the, the, the the argument is that Chaperson, it the the stakeholder says that it seems that uh, the, or like I said the partial the the, the, the facility that would be uh, either ECD or partial care will be required then to comply with three separate registration requirements registration as a partial care registration as an ECD and registration as ECD programs. So that's what the sector is raising or submitting to the committee. And also they, sub, they, they argue that the, 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 this kind of an approach that the, uh, that the sector will be subjected to, which is a one size fits all, is not con conducive to the center, the ECD sector chapters and members. They also submit that, um, the bill does not address the shift from the EC, of the ECD function from the Department of Social Development to the Department of Basic Education, which we, the committee just discussed uh, earlier. And also the, it is raised that the bill does not address the different types of ECD programs, modalities which are provided. There are non-center-based ECD and also center-based ECD programs. The non-center-based, for example, will include the playgrounds, the toy libraries, and home-based ECD uh, programs. So the argument here is that the bill does not address uh, that reality chain. Also, Chaperson, the stakeholder also submitted that the bill has been costed to about 32.4 billion in 2020, 2021 up to 58.3 billion in 2028-2029 to provide for a drastic increase in the expenditure of ECT infrastructure. However, there are no proposed amendments in the bill that provide for or justify for this costing. That was submitted by the stakeholders chair. And also the, 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 the bill fails to give effect to the ECT infrastructure provisions that are contained in the national ECT policy, which make a uh, provision for infrastructure plans, the local uh, government obligations for the maintenance and uh, provisions of the ECT, public ECT in poor areas. So in essence, Chairperson, the ECT sector and other uh, uh, stakeholders who commented on the provisions on the ECD, they put before the committee that the bill fails to address the challenges that are faced by the, the ECD sector in relation to the issues of registration, uh, norms and standards, provision of infrastructure, and other issues that I just spoke to Chairperson earlier. So they see the bill as a missed opportunity as far as that is concerned. There's also a submission that um, in terms of the program funding, that there's, there's, there's the bill uh, substitutes the, the word must to may. So the, the stakeholders are, uh, want clarity to be given why that is done and actually propose that the, 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 may, the may must be changed to a must. So that will mean that the MEC must prioritize and fund poverty declared wards in terms of the uh, facilities like ECD, drop-in centers, and all other facilities that are, uh, are meant for the protection of children. 
then in essence, just going back to the ECT chair, the, re the, the reforms that are being proposed by the sector, there are six of them that they submit that will um, change or address the challenges that are faced by the sector. The first one is for a simpler one-step registration process for ACT pro providers to be, uh, to be established. There must be a recognition of the different types of ECT programs. There must be um, accessible compliance standards and the removal of overlapping rules and responsibilities. Uh, here they allude to the provincial and the local government as well as national chairperson uh, spheres of government, the argument that there are overlapping responsibilities and roles. So the, the, the recommendation is that there must be a removal of that overlap. And there must be assistance to the ECT provided to the ECT provi uh, uh, programs or providers in the poor areas. And there must be an effective conditional registration framework in instances where an uh, ECT is given a partial um, registration or a conditional registration, as well as input that there should be a clear uh, definition of the partial and conditional registration. Because that is not clear, Chairperson requires the is concerned, and there must be a provision of infrastructure support. So the sector raises these reforms, Chairperson, as um, solutions to the challenges that are faced in the sector. When it comes to the issue of adoption, uh, the stakeholders, Chairperson, they mainly uh, raise the concern that. The, 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 the key challenges facing the sector results from the administrative delays from the Department of Social Development as the, uh, in issuing uh, documentations that are, are, are needed to process the adoption uh, of a child. So they argue that there are delays from the, from the department and this is what the should be actually focused on to address those challenges that cause delays in the adoption process. They submit to the committee that adoption agencies do not have any financial gains from the adoption fees, as these fees pay for the administrative and legal costs. This relates to, person to the proposed uh, provision in the bill to delete the section of the, of the act that deals with the adoption uh, um, uh, fees, uh, charging of the adoption fees. Then they also uh, I, I submit that an adoption is a specialized service, and so it should be performed by experienced social workers who are primarily working in the center. If you can recall, Chairperson, the bill uh, uh, makes um, uh, amendments to include the state um, social workers to perform adoption services. And the argument is that state social workers do not have that necessary expertise and are also overburdened by other social welfare services. That's the argument that is raised by the stakeholder chair. So in this instance, Chair, the stakeholders, they are opposed to the deletion of section 249 in its entirety, and they argue that it could allow for criminal exploitation. They say, Chair, the option by deleting the words, the, as a suggestion, the, the words receiving the prescribed fees. The objective of uh, the, the objective aimed at removing the regulating professional fees for adoption services from the act will be achieved. If you remember, Chair, the department had said it wants to uh, remove the the, the 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 provision that deal with the charging of the of the adoption fees. And so that they can be regulated elsewhere uh, with the professional uh, bodies uh, that would be uh, concerned. So the submission is that uh, only deleting the words receiving the prescribed fees will then achieve that objective that the, 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 the amendment seek to achieve. However, they made a caution that the proposed regulations of office by professional council take years, given that it takes some years for professional body to finalize a new code or regulations. Should the, the, table bill, the table bill reveal repeal section 249 in its entirety, 
this would in effect leave the space unregulated for some time. So the argument is that that's the caution that if then the, the, the session is deleted in its entirety and that the, the charging of the, prof, of the adoption fees would be regulated by professional bodies, that may have a time that will last before that is done when these bodies are uh, finalizing the new code or new regulations. So there may be a time lapse in between. Going back to the issue of, on, on the Department of Home Affairs, as far as the adoption services is concerned, the department raised a challenge of adoptive parents leaving South Africa without registering adoptions with the department. And so the department will never know that such a child has been adopted. And they also uh, uh, raised a concern that there have been instances that when children are not coping or fail to be integrated into the new country or adoptive country, they are often abandoned by their adoptive parents in those countries, making such Af these children uh, subjected to being sex slaves. So the submission of the department was that no child must be allowed to leave South Africa without a new certificate, birth certificate, bearing the new ID number with the adoptive parents in, 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 those, uh, in the birth certificate. And those children should not travel on the uh, 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 South African passport. That was this, uh, the, the submission made by the Department of Home Chair, I'm almost going to the end. The National Child Protection Register, the submission there was that um, the, the, the portion of a large portion of the submissions called for the, the register to be made more public in the context of the increasing traf child trafficking or human trafficking and adoption. So it must be uh, easily ac accessible by the public. However, other submissions that a person or, or stakeholders, they recommended that all provisions relating to part B of the child protection register be deleted and the criminal records system be used uh, instead, Chair. So that was the submission from other stakeholders that there is a criminal court, criminal record system in place. So that should be used instead and have the part B of the children's uh, child protection register deleted. Then there was one also uh, um, uh, input from the public that the act should, uh, it omits the role played by the NPOs and the civil society organizations and that in provision of the child protection service. This is despite the fact that these structures provide the majority of the services. So Chairperson, there are recommendations that were made that um, make, a, um, um, they make provisions for the NPOs and the civil society organization to be included in the bill. And the last one, Chair, the, just a general comments on the bill. It was, um, there was some a, a submission that was forwarded that uh, argued that the bill requires language editing and formatting and that it should be uh, drafted and, uh, in line with the Commonwealth uh, Conventions. And that particular uh, stakeholder gave a very detailed, uh, almost um, redrafting, if I can put it that way, but each clause, it made comments on how it should be improved in terms of language, in terms of editing and formatting uh, that would be forwarded to the department chairperson to consider. Also, Jefferson, on that, it was also submitted that the children's bill still requires a lot of work if it is to provide a more enabled legal framework for advancing universal access to quality ECT services. That now speaks to what I presented earlier in terms of the bill being a missed opportunity to the ECT sector. And also uh, in terms of that, that it fails to facilitate the holistic reform needed to ensure that inclusivity is built into the system and design of the frameworks put in place to protect children. In addition to the ECD chair, in this instance, there's, uh, there's submission, there's um, inputs from the public that propose that the bill or that submit that the bill only uh, Simply paper where it's put in the paper 
uh, such as disability and inclusion to, without making cross references in the entire uh, bill in, in, for sections that deal like section 11 of the act that specifically deal with the, uh, children with disabilities. So the comment is that the bill needs to make a cross reference to all aspects of the act that deal with uh, children with disabilities as it is now the bill phase it was. Also chair on the last comment that the bill is silent about the needs of our special uh, children with special needs and uh, who are need to be uh, accommodated. It, um, that will need, let me rephrase, the bill Chaperson, is silent about the, the, the needs, the children with special needs, so that it doesn't make any uh, 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 proposing, proposals or amendments as far as the special care centers that will accommodate children with learning disabilities and also Chairperson who are on the school, compulsory school going age. So we have those children, Chairperson with special needs who are on the, uh, who should be at school and those children will need to be in the special care centers. The bill makes no provision for such special centers, Chairperson. That's what the argument is. I think this is the end, Chairperson. I'm just including this part as the key issues that may be taken from the presentation, that the stakeholders in the main, they, they supported the, the legal solution that is proposed in the bill. However, they had raised an issue or concern as far as the insertion of section 1C of the, of the, of the bill. They proposed for the insertion of the ban of corporal punishment. They also, um, Proposed for the insertion of a chapter to deal with protection of children's personal information that I explained a letter present. The bill that is current for many focuses on the protection of children as far as the information of, of the identity in terms of the court proceedings. They also um, proposed there must be an explicit prohib prohibition of child marriages and uh, said uh, a, 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 Age, um, minimum age of 18 years. They also propose for the six reforms in the ECG sector. And in terms of, uh, of, of the adoption, they mainly submit that the, what needs to be addressed are the delays that are caused or emanating from the uh, administrative processing of the uh, uh, Department of Social Development as far as issuing documentations that are required for the adoption process. And just as I said, Leo Chairperson, also the bill needs to focus on services for children, especially. I thank you, Chair. Uh, it looks like a, a, wonderful, a wonderful piece of job. That's my view, honorable members. The intention here, honorable members, is not to debate our views on this, just to seek clarity because it's empowering the committee to actually fast track going through more than 3,000 or 2,000 something submissions. So that when we go to public hearings, we have a sense of what we're going to be engaged with because public hearings are about listening to our people seeking clarity to some of the things they raise, asking them to explain themselves in whatever. But our debate as a committee will come at a certain point in time when the views of the community are gelled together towards the National Assembly or whatever. So I'm saying it's purely for clarity seeking. Honorable members, uh, I see Honorable Masango, Honorable Leticia, in that order, Honorable Masango. Thank you, Chair. I um, cannot agree more with you um, on, on what you have just said uh, in thanking the content advisor so much for this presentation. And in some sense, he, the presentation has actually confirmed um, what I, I, I sensed to be um, a, a, a move 
or at least an attempt to stay away from the ECD related uh, aspects of the bill in the We've lost you, Honorable Masamu. That the uh, the virus is visiting your space. It doesn't want us to listen to you. Uh, are you muted? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. All right, you will come back. Let's go to Honorable Aris at the moment. Che, hello. Um, can you hear me, Che? Yes, or on scan warm. Yeah, Che, with you, I guess that my concern. I did not invite you to do that. Yeah, but they don't do that. <laughs> she, I think, you know what, um, maybe it is just a, a concern that I want to raise. And it is, to, to me, it is really worrisome that in terms of the Sexual, Offens uh, uh, Sexual Offenses Act, uh, consensual sex can be at, at the age 16. Um, which is worrisome because if you say consensual sex at the age of 16, it means that at the, at the age of 16, you can become a parent. So that, that is just a thing that I think that the committee must really uh, put at the, at the back side of their minds, you know, because as uh, we said that, you know, a, a, a child being seen um, 18 as, as, because 16 is still a minor age. So that's, that is really worrisome. And that's a thing that we really need to look and, you know, into thank you, Jay. Thank you, Honorable Aris. Uh, Honorable Masango, are you back? Well, in the meantime, Honorable yeah. Members, okay, in the, in the meantime, Honorable Members, especially coming from what Honorable Aris has just said, this is not a simple job, especially when you come to deal with the sense of judgment as related to age, you will find that more than 100 years or 70 or 60 years ago, a child of a particular age, his judgment would have been assessed to be capable of analyzing and taking informed decisions with regard to particular aspects of life. You might find that 70 years down the line, Things have changed. The point I'm trying to make is that maybe to you, Lee and Lindy, we might have to to consider in one or in one in, 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 at, at some point in time just to hear one or two psychologists who are established on the matter, age and uh, taking informed decisions. Do you understand what I'm saying, Yoli? Just, just to come and take us through, we listen to this. You know, sometimes uh, I've got uh, grandchildren here. <laughs> they, they scare me. Some of the things they understand. It took me a trick to understand them. I, I hope I'm not exaggerating. When I listen to them, how they reason. So we, we need to be guided on this. Uh, it's true, Chief. Yes, we need to be guided on this, but it's a, it's a very, very important point that Honorable Aris has raised. So we, we must not take emotional decisions around it. There must be a quite both domestically and internationally established norm before we take a decision on the matter, but it's a very, very important point. Uh, Honorable Masango is not here. Uh, it seems as if you only... Uh, let me welcome Honorable Stock. He was on a flight. Are you around, Honorable Stock? I'm here. I'm here, Honorable Chaperson. Yeah, thank you very we much. Thank, we thank the flight for releasing you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think your job was too good 
no one wants to engage it. I think it's too clear. And thank you for the sterling job. If it was not virtual, I was going to say, let's give you a big hand. But uh, virtual sometimes is not very much user friendly on some of these exercises. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Yoli. Uh, uh, second, last item is a coordinator's uh, item, Lindy. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, my um, item is just to update you um, of the work that is before the committee uh, of the public hearings, uh, the national and the provincial public hearings. Uh, I just want to uh, inform the, the committee that uh, the process to engage with the public, it's starting next week, uh, to respond to to listen to the sub formal submission written submissions by relevant by various stakeholders so we will start with the hearings virtually uh, from Tuesday the 11th uh, and uh, up to Thursday the 13th uh, mem uh, members uh, of the committee I just want to also inform the committee that we responded to the um, to the call or a request by um, a number about two organizations where they submitted the request to hold a closed session uh, uh, for children. So we uh, applied for, for, for the closed meeting to the Speaker of Parliament of the National Assembly and that um, application was approved. So on Friday, the 14th of May, uh, the members will be required to come down to Cape Town and then there will be a closed session at the Good Hope Chambers from three o'clock until seven o'clock. But members will be required to come early at two o'clock so that there will be a screening and registration and maybe children would like to have uh, take a group photo with members. And the last uh, public hearings, the only national um, uh, uh, hearings will be on the 18th of, 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 of May, Chairperson, which is Tuesday. Um, Chairperson uh, and members uh, also want to report that the, just to echo what Chairperson uh, reported the, about the provincial public hearings that um, our application was approved, um, but with uh, certain conditions and some amendments that were made that uh, the Friday, the 4th of June, uh, Parliament has scheduled a three-line whip, so all members will be required to attend the session starting at 10 o'clock. I don't know what time, will it end. sometimes about, about 5 o'clock. So we were advised to start our public hearings the following day. So our public hearings in the Limpombo will start on the 6th, which is Sunday, and then Friday the 5th will be um, set aside for members to travel to Limpombo because uh, there are no flights from Limpombo, from, jo from Johannesburg to Limpombo. Members will fly to Johannesburg, from Johannesburg they will drive four to five hours to Limpombo. So that Saturday of the 5th will be set aside for traveling day chair. So I circulated the program uh, for the national public hearings as well as the provincial public hearings. So that's, that is what I just wanted to report chair, that the- That, that traveling, that traveling in Popo include logistic transport organized by ourselves? No chair, um, we, will, we will, members will be flown by parliament from uh, there are various destinations to, to Johannesburg. And then in Johannesburg, there will be transport arranged by the committee for members to drive from Johannesburg to to, to, to Lipombo. Well, but why do you start by saying no? Because you are agreeing with what I'm asking. Oh, sorry, Chair, maybe I didn't hear you properly. Yeah, you know, you're, you're not making our case good. They say causes always start by saying no. No. <laughs> because... You, you just affirm what I was asking. Okay, Chase. That uh, it means you have organized a logistic transport from Joburg to Lipop. Yes, it's with you, Chase. Yes, yes. Don't start by saying no. <laughs> All members, that is the those are that is those are the logistic announcements. Anything that needs clarity? Honorable Masang, Honorable Alexander. Uh, thank you, Chair. I am not going to go back to when I was cut off, um, uh, when I was trying to speak. We've, we've, my apology, we've left that item. Okay, 
No problem yeah. at all. Um, Chair, with regards to the, uh, the, the logistic uh, arrangements that the Secretary has just gone through, I do not have any, any concerns. I, I actually uh, trust the process. I just wanted to find out uh, before we leave the, 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 the platform, the content advisor spoke of a comprehensive uh, submissions document. I just wanted to clear whether that is still um, are coming because I don't seem to have that, that in, my, in, my, uh, in my inbox yet. That's all I needed to find out, Chair. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Yoli, can you dispense with that? Yes, Chairperson. Yes, the, the, the members were provided yesterday with just a summary of that comprehensive document. That document, yes, members, it will be forwarded to you. It will also be forwarded to the department. Um, just, I, just, I just prioritized the summary for the sake of today's mm -hmm. meeting. Then I will then go back to just clean it out and take it for a peer review. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Linda, how, long, how much time are we going to spend in Lipopo? I can't hear you. Our chair is going to be four days. And From which we, day? Okay. Can I maybe just flight the the, 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 the the program or I'll just speak out? Quickly do that. Uh, it may not be necessary, but quickly do that. Flight, it is all right. Just to exploit your technological capabilities. <laughs> Ooh, I can't find it, chair. Let, we me are born again. We are born. <laughs> let, me, let me speak to it, Chet, because I know it's my heart. <laughs> you wanted to break, you want to break uh, with your company. Oh, one, six, one, six. Um, members, um, the traveling day, we will start with um, with public hearings in Impombo on the 6th of, of, of June, which is Sunday, for four days, because we are targeting four districts. So it's going to be the 6th, the 7th, the 8th, and the 9th which is Sunday to Wednesday in one province. Because of the proposed amendments, it made us impossible for members to come back to their various destination and resume the process. So for us to be in line with our original plan, so on Thursday, the 10th of June, we will drive from Limpombo to Malanga. And then we'll start the Mpumalanga uh, um, um, public hearings from 11 until the 14th. And then we come back to our homes. And then, and then we come back again to travel to the next province. Okay, that's, that's okay for the beginning. Thank you very much, honorable members. Any announcement? That's all for today, yes, am I right? Yes, my hands up. V Visa hand. It's Alex J. Okay, come on. Um, I just have a, a, a request um, for Lindy, if it's, if it's possible. Can we maybe also get a schedule that shows us which days we are traveling and which days we won't be in our home provinces so that we can diarize accordingly? And then just another request, can we find out from the um, what it, the whoever member's office? Because sometimes we get told we can't park our cars at the airports due to high tariff rates. So, you know, just maybe an indication from them if we can park our cars there or if we can't park our cars there, given the length that we'll be away. And then just lastly, Chairperson, you touched on the fact that if we commit to a year in, we, uh, in a province, we need to then, if we, and if we don't follow through, we need to be liable for accommodation. So my question will then be for every um, province and for every accommodation, are we going to get ask to, RSV, to RSVP for lack of a better term and then take it um, one year in at a time or do we RSVP for everything and then you know let Lindy we know if we can make it and can't make it because my concern is chairperson that members get sick last minute and then there's COVID scares and all of that and I just don't think uh, members should be held liable if they do fall ill and we also don't want members to travel if they are ill so just clarity around that um going no, no, no. Le, 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 i would propose that to deal with different situations when they come i don't want us to plan for absence 
people must raise their unique issues. Can we do it that way? We, we can, and then of course, just that schedule. Uh, for that. The, point I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that it is not unanticipated that there will be problems which we uh, are not uh, anticipated. But I, would, I wouldn't want us to spend time here how to master ensuring that we don't pay when we don't avail ourselves. If you're sick, I don't think anyone wants to debate that as long as the, that is truthful. We can't, okay. debate when, we can't debate when should people be sick. Can I, can I also? Yes. Jefferson, um, um, I'm a member, um, Alexander um, Abrahams, at the issue of airport, I think it is the members' um, responsibility to, for parking, but I will inquire with Fungil as to whether Parliament has uh, special arrangements for members to, to park. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know any change about that because I still park. I don't know where does that come from. Because I, if if you, if you you are you are parking because that's the only way you can be able to connect your transport. But but let's not undermine the question that all Honourable Zane is raising. Just clarify it so that if there's any confusion about it, we sort it out. It's okay. Okay. Secondly, uh, secondly, ma'am, uh, Chairperson, also to add up to the condition. Maybe uh, Mr. Thorog or Mitch to mention the issue of flight changes. Um, members didn't pitch, and then the flight is booked, and then member wants to make changes. All of a sudden, he feels that no, she's got other meeting. He wants to cut the visit, you know, short. And then if there are differences in terms of the flight, when the Fungile tries to make amendments, that also the the, the change the, the the difference will be charged from the members uh, account. Secondly, I would like our members that have alternate members to indicate because Fungile is going to distribute a travel form where members must be in the old, a travel form um, um, uh, uh, containing the dates and the provinces to be visited. And then members just need to indicate whether they will attend or not so that we, we are quite sure as to which members will be going to which provinces. Secondly, the members that have alternate just to indicate whether they, is it the permanent daily members that will be attending and, and then whether they alternate because for example, the Democratic Alliance have three members. In terms of the committee allocation composition, they were supposed to be two members. So they just need to indicate whether the permanent members that will be attending public hearings or if the uh, alternate wants to attend, it will be on her costs. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, thank you. Chairperson. Yes. Can I check something also? We're coming to the pop, man. You mustn't check anything. <laughs> No, I'm not going to change. Uh, All right. No, I, okay. All right. I wanted, to check, I wanted to check the situation. Like, uh, you know, that in the Pompo for now, uh, uh, flights has been suspended or what? I don't know. But let's say, for instance, we, we're we going to Jobek. Am I going to drive or the committee is going to send me a transport that will transport me from my area to Jobek? Also, uh, Northwest, uh, Bloemfontein, or what? How am I going to to attend if I'll be saying that I'm available to do oversight on those provinces? My, my understanding, Honorable uh, Kate, uh, is that all the transport needs eh. that are outside your normal uh, parliamentary work uh -huh. between provinces and accommodations are taken care of by the state. Am I correct, uh, Lindy? Uh, yes, I think so, Chair. Just that Fungile, uh, is, she's a, he's a specialist on, on that area. Where is Fungile? Is Fungile here? He's here, Chair. I'm, I'm here, Chair. Explain yourself, Funga. Yes, yes, you are quite correct, Chair. If the, the, the member is traveling for work related, then the, the, the parliament uh, reimburses the, the, the member. For this, for these public hearings, yes, yes, not their routine parliamentary. Chairperson, yes, Chairperson, is he yes. talking about reinvestment or talking about transportation? 
Can you explain it again, Honorable Bilakul, so that we, we, we must show what we're answering to? Just, just heard, repeat what is, your, what is your worry? I heard Fungeni saying they're going to reimburse. I was asking and, about transportation. Maybe, from, maybe it's English, I don't know. Let's say, for instance, from, the oversight is to take place in Northwest. And hmm. from Lipombo to Northwest, there's no flight. It means I'll be driving. Am I going to use my own transport? Oh, the portfolio committee is going to send a transport that will ferry me from Lipompo to the Northwest. No, no, I, I, maybe Fungil will explain. My understanding is that we now, for instance, for four days we'll be in Lipompo. We're coming from different provinces. Anyone who travels from Lipompo to Mpumalang would be taken care of by the state. Because I think the other, the other approach is a bit awkward. <laughs> uh, let me be careful, this is not my explanation. L let me, if I understand, because it, it's, it's an interesting question. Let us say Fungile, Milangolo could not attend the hearings in, in Limpop or maybe for whatever reason, she could not finish that, two, that four days, she goes home. Now we are moving from Lipopo to Pumalang. No, she must join us in Lipopo. Anyway, let me listen to you. Can, you. can you answer that question? The question is, let me be concrete so that I don't claim to have an answer. She says, if I'm using this, this clearer example, that if we're in Lipopo, by the way, Bilakul, where do you stay in Lipopo? In Giani. That's it, Giani. Mm. Let us say she was not able to attend the four days, or she could not finish the four days. She went to Giani. Now, we are going on the, the last day, we're going to Pumalanga. She's in Giani. Mm. What, what is she supposed to do? Fungil, are you going to be able to, to respond? Yes, I can. Okay. Answer, Fungil. That's our question. I'll add if you are failing. Okay. Sorry. In that instance, if as, as the hearings will be in Limpopo, so in other words, maybe Languli is going to be in Limpopo, therefore it means we will meet him here in Limpopo. But then in, if we are traveling from Limpopo to, to, to Mpumalanga, then she will be able to join us from Limpo, from Limpopo to Tumamaranga. Therefore, it means the cost uh, has been carried by parliament. But in that instance of where, where there are no- You are saying, you are saying, we, let us say we're leaving Pulugwan. Let's say we're leaving from Pulugwan. I'm just making an yes. example. Straight to Mpumalang. She's in Kiani. Yes. She decides to drive from Kiani to join us in Pumalang. But yes. where, where does she keep her car? Or, uh, you, know, you know the implications of that? Yes. Because if she drives, with, if she drives from Kiani to Pumalang, when we move to the next province, she, she won't leave her car. So are you going to take care of those costs? How, uh, how many people can... Let's, let's, let's be clear about that. Chairperson, um, can, I, can I try to, to assist? Please explain okay. it. Yeah. Uh, Parliament very uh, members from respective um, provinces to where the public hearings take place. Mm. Uh, there will be nothing different uh, for member Bilankolo if the flights were operating, were operational. She, parliament would have put her a flight from, um, from, 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 from Lipombo to whatever. So mm. now I think let's yeah, take out the discussion. Let's, can I, Mama? Thank you, I'm answered. Yeah, answered, ne? Yeah, I'm I think- answered 100%. So they will be different, they will make arrangements, ma'am. I think she will speak to the manager, uh, we'll make an arrangement, we're quite happy that she raised the issue, so um, they will, it should be treated as such that she's part of Listen. the committee, she wants to attend. Yeah. Let's leave those logistics with yourself, and I must never try again to think about the answer. 
because this is not my area of work. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> well, members, we had a great day. Thank you very much. <laughs> I must wish you a long weekend. Let's meet uh, in Cape Town. The date is? For Cape Town is Friday, Chen. For the first time we're meeting on Friday in Cape Town. Yes, yes, Lana, with, with children. For the first time. That is when our hearings are beginning. No, Chen. Uh, yes, in, in, in physical. The, the hearings are starting on Tuesday, the 11th. Virtually. Virtual. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And Thursday, yes, Chen. But everyone must be in Cape Town on Friday. On Friday, Chen. Uh, and the next but hearing Friday after, after noon, but it's and Friday the next afternoon. And the, and the next hearing is after the 14th? It is the 18th, Chair, the last the last uh, round of hearing is the 18th, which is Tuesday. Virtual. Until June. Until June. Yes, Chair. After the 18th, there's a gap until June. After the 18th, Chair, there is that technical team we made an undertaking that they will appear as on the 19th. Uh, as well, then on the 19th chair, we'll also adopt the budgetary um, uh, report on APPs because there's a debate scheduled for 25th of, of, of May. Okay. Or for the short, for TSD. So we come budget. back to the hearing in June. Yes, chair. Okay, fine. And Thank you very much. Time. Wish you a nice weekend. We meet on Tuesday, honorable member, on virtual platform. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.